This episode of Intelligent Medicine is brought to you by Youthful Energy, providing you with a unique energy support of pure NT Factor. NT Factor is the only nutritional formula clinically proven to reduce fatigue, whatever the cause, age, illness, or just being run down. NT Factor from Nutritional Therapeutics repairs damaged cells and restores healthy bacteria in your digestive tract. Clinical trials have shown NT Factor reduces fatigue by almost half, and it even reverses some symptoms of aging. I've been taking NT Factor for years. With a 45-day money-back guarantee, you have nothing to lose. To order, call 800-982-9158, 800-982-9158, or go to ntfactor.com. That's ntfactor.com. Welcome back to today's Intelligent Medicine Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Ronald Hoffman. The book we're talking about, The Monsanto Papers, Deadly Secrets, Corporate Corruption, and One Man's Search for Justice, uh, our guest investigative journalist, Carrie Gillum. Uh, and Carrie is uh, very familiar with the subject of uh, glyphosate and its hazards, uh, having written a, a previous book on the subject entitled Whitewash, um, which I interviewed you about uh, a couple of years ago. So... Um, Thanks for coming back on with us with an update. Uh, so, Carrie, you know, uh, they're making a big fuss about does glyphosate cause cancer? And uh, they've made it controversial. You know, the World Health Organization says yes. The EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, says no, nah, probably not. Uh, in court, it's been demonstrated that um, Monsanto was aware of the carcinogenic effects of glyphosate exposure, uh, it's pretty clear that in certain cases it can contribute to uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and other types of cancer. Um, the stuff was designed uh, to just target plants, right? It's a weed killer. Mm -hmm. And so the supposition was that it did not affect mammalian cells. Uh, but it turns out that it works uh, on... Uh, a pathway that's present in invertebrates and in bacteria. It's called the shikimate pathway. And that's kind of concerning because if it damages bacteria, uh, a lot of people these days are saying that it might have a negative effect on the microbiome, which is really import an important uh, mediator of health for us all. Exactly, yeah. And that has sort of been a an evolving area of inquiry and more science is building uh, around that to, to show. And, and what we're seeing is that it, it looks like it does indeed uh, have a, you know, what could be a potentially harmful impact on that gut microbiota, which then can have an array of, you know, um, impacts on human health overall. When you start messing around with the gut, <laughs> right. you you can you would you would know better than I, but uh, you can have a whole array of of issues and problems. And so, there are just even in the last year, there have been several new studies that have come out, and and researchers are really trying to understand the depths of this. Um, because yes, I mean, for many years, Monsanto always marketed this as doesn't harm pets and people, um, you know, mammals, as you said, um, because it didn't, this pathway was different, um, from the pathway in plants, but we do see that in the bacteria in the gut. So it's very alarming, you know, and, um, very concerning about much more than just cancer. Right. And, and so we have an extreme example of, in, you know, previous hour, we talked about, uh, Lee Johnson, uh, who was a groundskeeper who literally got bathed in the stuff. And some people are saying, well, you know, I don't, I don't even use the stuff. You know, I, I, I just, you know, manually pick my weeds. Uh, so, you know, uh, I'm not, I'm not at risk. Uh, this is just a problem for, you know, people who, uh, you know, are ignorant, use, you know, Roundup liberally, or maybe their jobs require them to use Roundup because it's not been banned. It's, you know, it's still ubiquitous. Uh, I was in a hardware store the other day and some big burly guy stood, you know, standing in front of me and he, he bought like a giant sized container of Roundup and, you know, he looked pretty happy <laughs> about it. Um, I was going to say something to him, but I thought he like might beat me up. He kind of looked like a hell of an angel. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, 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 I zipped it and just said, you know, have a nice day, sir. Yeah, he um, probably smoked cigarettes too. Yeah, he, right? he looked like he looked like that type where you know we weren't particularly concerned about uh, you know uh, harmful substances, shall we say? You know, yeah. uh, but so the, the point I'm being I'm making is that this is a ubiquitous uh, substance. It's in the environment. 
uh, it's in our foods to the extent that we uh, use GMO foods. So what's the deal? You know, you know, what's the connection between glyphosate and GMO foods? And why right. does it make sense to um, possibly minimize our exposure to GMO foods? I mean, you know, some people think, oh, these are Franken foods. You know, they, they weren't designed as nature intended. You know, maybe they can alter our DNA, you know, and then, you know, scientists say, nah, that's ridiculous. This is progress. These are, you know, it's like a new form of hybridization. No biggie here. <laughs> well, right. And so we're not going to talk, get into all of the science on GMOs, but GMO, genetically engineered crops, seeds, um, that it doesn't, it's not just a different type of hybrid. It doesn't, it's a type of genetic alteration that doesn't occur in nature where you're taking DNA from a species and putting it into an entirely different species um, that in nature would never sort of happen in that way. But that's a whole nother conversation. Um, GMOs, the, the main type of genetically engineered crop, the main trait that is planted around the world currently, and this was the case 20 years ago and this is the case today, is the, is the trait that confers herbicide tolerance, which means that the crop ready, that, grows, so called. Yeah. that grows from that seed can be sprayed directly with an herbicide and will not die. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that you can imagine uh, leaves that plant, that crop, if it's sprayed directly with weed killer, the residues of that weed killer are going to remain in the finished food product. And it's, you know, it's been documented by scientists and researchers in our USDA and FDA of glyphosate residues in a whole array of foods. Um, and But the important thing is that it's not just GMOs. Glyphosate is used on non-genetically engineered mm -hmm. um, crops as well. And so you'll be finding glyphosate. Glyphosate's found in honey. Uh, I remember when I first got those internal documents from our USDA. It was either, or no, it was FDA. Is it intentional and, or inadvertently that it gets on the crops? Well, so honey is a special case because the bees bring the glyphosate oh. back to the hive. Oh. But, um, but like in the case of wheat, for right. instance, wheat is not genetically engineered to be sprayed with mm -hmm. glyphosate. Monsanto wanted it to be for a long time and tried to introduce that, and the farmers rejected it. But farmers still do spray it. Monsanto came up with this great idea and said, hey, you, could, um, you can use it as a desiccant, meaning... If your fields are particularly wet or cool and you want to, you know, um, accelerate a harvest and you, you know, you want to dry out your crops, you can spray wheat right before you harvest it uh, with this weed killer. And it'll essentially kill it off and then you can harvest the grain and make flour and the flour will contain residues of, of glyphosate and you'll make bread and you'll eat the bread and then you'll have glyphosate in your body. <laughs> it's the way it works. Um, so, so over and over and over again now our so, yeah. so, it's, so it's both inadvertent and deliberate that it's uh, being uh, promulgated in the environment. And a lot of people have concerns about what it might be doing to soil quality. And we know that uh, the soil is really a living thing. Uh, and uh, you know, by killing off certain bacteria that are present in the soil, soil has a microbiome too, that we may be uh, damaging the integrity of our soils. Well, yes, exactly. And... You know, this is, again, it's, it's only one pesticide, one synthetic chemical used in farming, but it is the most widely used herbicide in the world. It's used very prevalently by farmers. Uh, the science has shown that as you use more and more of this, it is detrimental to the health of the soil. Um, just like our gut, you know, in a way, it, the soil health is tied to bacteria and, and fungi and Plants need that healthy soil to grow in a healthy way and to be nutritious. And when you when you damage that, you know the plant becomes less, you know, viral. I guess more viral is not the right word, but viable. becomes more susceptible, okay. vital, more oh, susceptible yeah. to disease mm -hmm. and uh, you know insects and and other pests. And so farmers then are using you know then more fertilizer. More, they may require more pesticides and more, more herbicides. herbicides. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. It's a vicious cycle um, that we're we've got caught in, and it and it's damaging our health and the health of the environment. Pollinators are being affected, birds and bees, butterflies. Um, it's really just become, you know, an, an environmental 
disaster. Yeah, I, I read an article. You know, they just, they have this this colony, you know, destruction syndrome among bees. You know, bees are disappearing in many parts of the world, and they're essential to our you know to pollination and to perpetuating plant life. Um, and so they 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 can't figure out what it is. Uh, and they've done studies that say you know probably glyphosate doesn't kill bees. But they actually did a study showing that the bees have a microbiome. <laughs> that the microbiome in bees is being altered by the glyphosate. The bacteria that are essential uh, within the tiny guts of the bees uh, are being altered. Uh, and that this may have you know, some subtle undermining effect on, on the bees' resilience and immunity. So, I mean, it's not clear that this is the culprit. There's so many other things out there that... You know, it's a multifactorial problem. Okay, folks, at this point, let's allow one of our sponsors to share an important message with you. Here it goes. Do you suffer with chronic pain? Are you taking risky, over-the-counter, or prescription anti-inflammatory drugs? This is Dr. Ronald Hoppe with a better natural solution from Future Farm Botanicals. Liquid Turmeric Liposome Complex. Future Farm's liquid turmeric with liposomes and nanotechnology delivers maximum absorption for effective pain relief. Sourced and manufactured in the United States, this product contains 1,600 milligrams of curcumin and powerful antioxidant properties. This plant-based curcumin is used to possibly reduce inflammation, block proteins that trigger swelling, and intercept inflammatory pathways, significantly decreasing inflammatory responses. For more information and to order, call 888-841-7216, 888-841-7216. Or go to myfuturefarm.com slash Hoffman. That's future P-H-A-R-M. Myfuturefarm.com slash Hoffman. Don't live with pain when there's an all-natural, science-based remedy that works. Myfuturefarm.com slash Hoffman. Myfuturefarm.com slash Hoffman. Thanks for listening and thanks for supporting our sponsors. They're what make Intelligent Medicine continuing free resource to you. And now back to today's guest, the author of the Monsanto Papers, Carrie Gillum. Here's an idea. You know, let's say I come up with a unique fuel. You know, it's a brand new, super efficient fuel, um, different from, you know, gasoline, even high octane. And it's great stuff. It's a great invention. And I decide to market this fuel via gas stations that only offer my Ronald Hoffman fuel. Moreover, cars have to be specially adapted to use this fuel. So I set up Ronald Hoffman Motors. This is kind of a model like uh, Rockefeller's vertical uh, standard oil monopoly, you know, where they had like, uh, you know, they, they, they got the oil out of the ground. They refined it. They, you know, had the gas stations. Uh, they were vertically integrated is the term. And that's a lot of what this is about. When you're using Roundup Ready uh, crops, uh, you literally... Uh, sell your soul to the devil because you become dependent on now Bayer, used to be Monsanto, for both the herbicide and the seeds. And you can't use regular seeds anymore because if you use your good old-fashioned seeds, the Roundup would kill off your seeds, right? Yeah, I mean, exactly. It, it was always designed to be sort of a, a package deal, um, you know, a, a system. And the company did for many years package them and market them together through distributors and all. They got in a little bit of trouble with the Justice Department for, you know, some of that and had to change their marketing. Um, but, and there are many other com companies, we should understand. I mean, Monsanto licensed their their gene technology to other companies. And, and so they sell genetically engineered seeds as well. And, and Monsanto and other companies have now invented crops that you spray with other herbicides, dicamba and 2,4-D mm -hmm. mm -hmm. on top of the glyphosate. I mean, this this just goes on and on and on. Well, some uh, of the creates. weeds are developing uh, glyphosate resistance, right, as so often happens in Correct. nature. Correct, yes. So much glyphosate has been used because of these genetically engineered crops that we're just spraying over the fields entirely over and over again. Um, that weeds developed resistance. Millions of acres of farmland have suffered now from weed resistance to glyphosate. So, yeah, farmers are looking for alternatives, and that means, you know, genetically engineered crops now they can spray not only with glyphosate, but also with 2,4-D or this other herbicide called dicamba. And as you said, they've become almost dependent now. So one lawyer I talked to 
calls it, you know, it's like a drug deal. Yeah. You know, they, <laughs> they get sucked in and they can't break their habit um, mm-hmm. because it would require systemic change in their farming practices. And some countries across the world are trying to uh, resist this, but there's a lot of pressure uh, from Monsanto as a big international company, uh, sometimes in cahoots with the U.S. government to pressure companies to accept uh, uh, genetically engineered crops, uh, along, which uh, align with um, the use of uh, glyphosate and other uh, herbicides, right? Yeah, I just uh, did a story uh, for, in The Guardian about Mexico. I, I have it right in front of me. That's your story? Oh, yeah. It's yeah, a yeah. headline Mex- revealed. Yeah. Monsanto owner and U.S. officials pressured Mexico to drop glyphosate ban. That's your story? Mm-hmm. Well, my name's right next to it, unless you're looking at a printout. <laughs> I'm looking at a printout. It, it dropped your name. Oh, so credit oh, to you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, I was going to say, did, did you see the story? Yeah. It's like you wrote the story. I wrote the story um, last month, uh, and it was similar to what they did in Thailand. But right, we have internal government emails that show, you know, Mexico basically deciding that they wanted to move away from uh, imports of GMO corn, uh, which farmers spray with glyphosate, and they wanted to ban glyphosate. Uh, and they've actually started, you know, rejecting shipments. Um, and Bayer, which owns Monsanto, has been very upset about this and reached out to different government officials for help to pressure Mexico into abandoning, you know, this this plan. And, you know, the, the thing that got me and I write about it in the story is, you know, the Mexican government says we're doing this for the purpose of contributing to food security and sovereignty and mm-hmm. the health of Mexican mm-hmm. men and women. Yeah. And yet. Our government is all concerned about the profits of these companies. Mm. And, uh, you know, it's... Same same thing in Thailand, according to your article. Yeah, the same thing in Thailand happened a couple of years ago. Thailand said, we're going to ban glyphosate. And Monsanto Bear reached out and the lobbying groups that they work with and fund and got the the U.S. government involved. And Thailand actually backed off of it. Mm. Um, and, said okay we won't ban it but mexico so far is holding to their their position uh, so far <laughs> and, and here was a big brouhaha and i read about it in your book uh about uh ecuador which is adjacent to colombia i'm watching uh the uh, netflix series narcos you know about uh the uh, mm. cocaine business and apparently uh the dea decided that they were going to do an eradication program uh by spraying the coca plants <laughs> with glyphosate uh and it it didn't go well there was some drift over to uh, ecuador uh, and a lot of people were harmed, and then Ecuador is going to the international courts. What became of that? I mean, that's sort of a, an antecedent to this uh, widespread litigation in the United States. Yeah, I mean, I wrote about a bit about all of that in uh, in Whitewash, but <clears throat> yeah, I mean, this is basically aerial spraying of glyphosate, you know, so that you you know go over these sweeping, you know areas of these rural areas where they've been growing cocoa, you know, the ingredient in cocaine, uh, the chief ingredient and the spraying of, with this glyphosate, you know, does a really good job on the ground. Mm -hmm. But what studies have found is that it's not so good for people who are exposed, right? The people living in those rural communities and, you know, studies have shown dramatic DNA changes in these people. And that was part of the evidence that went before the world health organization, um, tying glyphosate use to to cancer. Um, Shades of Agent but, Orange, which is also, a, right. I believe, a, was a Monsanto Right, and, and they did suspend it. You know, they suspended it for a while, and there has been litigation and lawsuits and all sorts of things. But, you know, the U.S. government is pretty much backed by Monsanto and Bayer and others saying, you know, no, you need to keep spraying this. <laughs> so, um, well, Monsanto is a very powerful company. You know, I recall early in my uh, radio career, must have been about 30 years ago or so, uh, I did a program on the potentially harmful effects of uh, NutraSweet. And, you know, I do a lot of stuff and a lot of controversial stuff. And uh, I had a lot of, you know, I was kind of an independent uh, journalist of one on this uh, radio station, prominent radio station in New York. Uh, And I never received any pushback. They figured, you know, let this guy rant on. Uh, But that was the only time where I got called on the carpet by the management of the station. They said, look, you know, what you put out there, um, has uh, raised the hackles of a very big company, and they uh, have issued us a demand that they get equal time on your program. 
So I said, okay, fine. You know, they can send their best scientific representative and we'll have a chat. And uh, so, you know, he kept talking about the safety, the safety, the safety of NutraSweet. And I said, look, I mean, you look like a gentleman of a generation where you might have a grandchild. I tried Mm. to humanize it. I said, so for your grandchild, uh, how many glasses of a NutraSweet sweetened beverage do you think would be suitable? One glass? And he said, sure. Yeah, fine. I said, four glasses? And he paled a little bit. He was in studio and he said, well, because uh, he was an honest guy. He said, well, you know, in, in rat studies, we use a nor-. I said, but what about for humans? So what about for your grandchildren? He said, well, you know, that's unusual. I said, well, what if your grandchild were to take four NutraSweet sweetened beverages per day? He said, well, I, I mean, I can't vouch for the safety of that. And uh-huh. I kind of had him on that. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah. uh, notwithstanding, you know, all the science that they had to muster. Uh, and I thought, well, you know, uh, kind of killed two birds with one stone. I gave them an opportunity to air their concerns. But on a very human level, uh, the audience could sense his reluctance to expose his own grandchildren to high levels of uh, their product. So right. anyway, so so you, you did a beautiful job uh, in your books, uh, Whitewash and now the Monsanto Papers about revealing the you know, as the book says, the deadly secrets, the corporate corruption, uh, and one man's search for justice uh, in an effort to um, to 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 kind of right the wrong of uh, exposure to this stuff, and to sound the alarm that we we need to pay heed to the science. We definitely do need to pay heed to the science. And one thing that came out of this book, too, that I I came to realize, and I I guess I hope other people will, too, is the importance of this, you know, these lawyers, the the plaintiff's bar, the people that are out there bringing these cases. And, you know, I write about it's not a perfect system. You know, it's definitely not. Mm -hmm. I definitely saw a lot of the, 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 the good, the bad and the ugly. Um, that goes into this sausage making sort of thing about bringing these mass tort cases. But gosh, without it, mm-hmm. without the system and these lawyers, yep. our regulators are not protecting us. And yep. it, we it, need that system. It, it's a real dilemma because on the one hand, you know, we have so many regulations that it, in fact, it's really hard to do business. On the other hand, if we were to remove all these restraints, uh, we would have some real uh, devastation, you know, and when uh, Upton Sinclair first wrote The Jungle, I think it was like early 1900s, uh, it suddenly made people aware of the adulteration of food in America. And then we had, we established something called the FDA, you know, and then later, I guess it was, took quite a long time. It was in the 1960s, the Environmental Protection Agency. A lot of people think the Environmental Protection Agency has been around forever. Uh, it's not a perfect agency. It's often a revolving door for uh, industry folks, but it's an, it is at least a partial bulwark against, you know, a letter rip mentality when it comes to exposing Americans to toxic things. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's their job. They, they really, yes, yes. You said they were only formed in 1970. They haven't been around mm-hmm. that long. Um, I guess, historically speaking, but you know, you've got really good, hardworking scientists in there trying to do their jobs. And then you have political appointees and others at the, you know, higher ranking levels that are really feeling the influence and the arm twisting by these companies. And we need more scientific integrity in our agencies. Uh, and the then, evidence is clear. On that. And then we have the fourth estate, which is uh, journalism. And you, I think, exemplify uh, the best of uh, journalism on the science front, uh, pointing out these hazards and doing, you know, uh, you know, really uh, credible investigation uh, of some of these these issues. And, you know, the Monsanto papers really lays it out. So I recommend Thank it very you. highly. And, you know, you're you're on the circuit. Your book is getting a lot, a lot of uh, views. Uh, it's on social media. And, you you know, it's on, yeah. you're, you have a high <laughs> profile now. So Thank you. I, I'm glad you're out there to uh, uh, warn the audience about some of the potential downsides of some of these chemicals that we've haphazardly introduced into our environment. So thank you, Carrie Gillum, for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I appreciate being here. And by the way, is there a website where we can learn more about your work? Oh, sure. Yeah, well, 
um, www.carygillam.com, if you spell my name right, uh, C-A-R-E-Y-G-I-L-L-A-M, you can find my book and or news articles that I write and just more about me. And um, Island Press is my publisher. And then I do nonprofit research, uh, getting documents, freedom of information documents for U.S. Right to Know, which is a nonprofit. And then I write for The Guardian, as you pointed out. Indeed. Well, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. It was great. Thank you. I'm Dr. Ronald Hoffman, and this is the Intelligent Medicine Podcast. As an Intelligent Medicine listener, you know how important it is to ensure that your supplements are genuine, safe, and effective. But vetting your sources and tracking down the exact products you need can be a hassle. That's why I'm inviting you to browse my online supplement dispensary at drhoffmanstore.com. We stock only the highest quality supplements, some of which are very hard to find elsewhere. The very same supplements I prescribe to my patients and take myself. My specially curated professional grade supplements are fulfilled via the Fullscript network. Fullscript is the safest and most convenient way to purchase my medical grade supplements. Buying through Fullscript offers fast shipping, optional refill reminders, a mobile friendly site. It's safe, secure, and HIPAA compliant and offers world-class support. Just go to drhoffmanstore.com to sign up for your free Fullscript account. That's drhoffmanstore.com, drhoffmanstore.com.